Assalamu alaikum. Welcome back to class. The essay that we'll be dealing with today is The Two Races of Men. And you know that this is one of Charles Lamb's essays. So let us see what he has for us in this. Now, before we go on um, to the text of the essay, I would like to take you back to the um, initial lectures that uh, we did on uh, the different types of essays. And I would like you, while you are reading um, the text and following the lecture, to think of the type of essay that is known as a comparison essay. What you are going to have in this essay is the two races of men. So uh, you know that there are going to be um, two types that are going to be compared in this essay. So uh, I want you to have this firmly in your mind when we uh, go through the text. The human species, according to the best theory I can form of it, is composed of two distinct races, the men who borrow and the men who lend. So straight away, you know that in this essay, Lamb is going to make a comparison. He says that there are two uh, races of men. Now, you and I know that uh, when we uh, talk of races, um, th human beings are divided into different races, into different ethnicities. We talk of uh, the Aryan race, uh, we talk of uh, race in terms of color, and we talk about the red people, that is, um, the Aboriginal people of the American continents. We talk about the yellow people. When we're talking about the Chinese and the Japanese, we talk about um, the Africans. Uh, we talk about uh, Asians, Indians, Pakistanis. There's so many um, different categories that human beings have divided themselves into. But the categories into which Lamb is dividing human beings, or as he says, the human species, uh, is very different. So according to him, there are only two races of men, one who borrow and the other who lend. He is not concerned with class, with language, with uh, creed or faith. Um, he's not talking about geographical um, categorization. He is just dividing human species into two broad categories. Uh, one comprising the borrowers, the others comprising the lenders. So it's rather interesting how he divides um, the entire human species into two races. To these two original diversities may be reduced all those impertinent classifications of Gothic and Celtic tribes, white men, black men, red men. Okay, now he, he's not including the yellow men, but um, nevertheless, let us see how he divides um, human beings or the human species, as he calls it, into two races. He says these are the original distinctions. Regardless of color or faith or um, ethnicity or language, these are the two broad categories into which the human species can be described. And he says um, that classifications of human beings into the Gothic and the Celtic, into the red men or the white men or the black men, are rather impertinent. Or, from his point of view, they are not really classifications of men. Now, now you need to, um, to see the irony uh, that is hidden in Lamb's uh, statements. He's not talking about categorization on the basis of color or creed. He is talking of something that he considers to be more important than either class or creed 
اور ریس اور کلر اور ریلیجنس ریلیجن ہی از ڈیوائڈنگ دی ہیومن اسپیشیز انٹو ٹو بارورس اینڈ لینڈرز آل دا ڈویلرز اپون ارتھ پارتھینز اینڈ میٹس اینڈ الیمٹیز فلاک ہیدر اینڈ ڈو نیچرلی فال ان ود ون اور ادر آف دیز پرائمری ڈسٹنکشنز نا یو گاٹ ٹو ٹو کیپ ان مائنڈ دا فیکٹ دیٹ لیم ان میکنگ دیز ٹو براڈ کیٹیگریز از ناٹ ڈوئنگ اٹ ود آؤٹ اے ریزن and he's going to establish these categories that he has made in a way which convinces the reader that yes there are only two races of men borrowers and lenders so he goes back into ancient history and he says that um, divisions of human beings categorization of human beings has been done throughout history uh, and this categorization has undergone change during the course of time um, entire millennia have passed by and the categories of human beings have continued to change with changing times if in ancient history um, human beings were divided into Parthians and Medes and Elamites now you have human beings being divided or being categorized in different ways we classify them according to their color we classify them according Um, to their geographical locations we classify them according to their beliefs and we say that these are the Christians these are the Buddhists the Muslims the Hindus the Sikhs um, and so many other uh, categories we divide them on the basis of language so and so uh, speaks uh, Pashto so he is a different um, ethnicity so and so speaks Sindhi or Balochi or Siraiki or Kashmiri or um, Italian or French or Arabic or Persian and we divide them according to uh, those categories we also divide them according to their political affiliations so and so belongs to the Uh, the Muslim League, another person belongs to the People's Party or to the Tariq Insaf or um, to the Awami National Party or to the Labour Party, to the Liberal Party, to the Democratic Party, to the Conservative. So we divide them according to their political affiliations also. But what Lamb is trying to emphasize here is that all of these people can be placed in these two categories those of borrowers and those of lenders whether you are uh, Muslim, Indian, uh, Hindu, Sikh, uh, white, red, uh, Punjabi speaker or Pashto speaker you will fall into one of these categories so he says that uh, the infinite superiority of the former which I choose to designate as the great race is discernible in their figure port and a certain instinctive sovereignty so let's go back a bit and he says that um, the two categories that I named um, in the beginning the men who borrow and those who lend those are the categories into which all human beings throughout history can be categorized and he says that those who lend are born degraded those who borrow and there's a there's a definite uh, tongue-in-cheek humor here when he says that the borrowers are infinitely superior to the lenders He shall serve his brethren, 
the lender is the one for whom the Bible says he shall serve his brethren so definitely a lower status there is something in the air of one of his of one of this caste lean and suspicious contrasting with the open trusting generous manners of the others according to him the one who borrows is looks healthy looks happy the one who lends always has a suspicious look on his face is always thin is always worrying always has a frown on his face is always thinking about something is worried is concerned whereas the borrower has not a care in the world goes around smiling at everyone giving a very happy look so obviously the borrower is the superior race the lender is the inferior race and the inferior race must serve the superior race observe who have been the greatest borrowers of all ages Alcibiades, Falstaff, Sir Richard Steele, our late incomparable Brinsley, what a family likeness in all four. Falstaff, you know, is the, the fool in Henry IV, um, a play that has been written by uh, Shakespeare and which shows the character of Falstaff who is always borrowing from other people and he's presented as a fat man, a jovial man, one who cracks jokes, one who enjoys life, he eats a lot, he jokes around um, and uh, he says that if you look at some of the great borrowers um, and he even mentions Sir Richard Steele because um, uh, Lamb thinks that um, Sir Richard Steele as uh, a businessman um, depended to a great extent on borrowing money and uh, if we go into this uh, comparison in, in depth and in detail uh, from Lamb's point of view the, um, the style that Steele adopted was also borrowed because um, if you go back to the essays that we did from the spectator Joseph Addison and Steele were writing in the same newspaper and uh, their styles were so similar that at times it was difficult to make out which one of them was actually writing the essays so according to Lamb Sir Richard Steele is one of the borrowers and he says that you know all these uh, characters that he has quoted uh, from history from literature from contemporary society they have the same likeness and that is that they appear happy they have not a care in the world what a careless even deportment hath your borrower what rosy gills what a beautiful reliance on providence doth he manifest taking no more thought than lilies so he says he looks healthy he goes around with a happy smile on his face he doesn't think about anything and so the borrower is definitely um, the superior race and the lender is the inferior race and a race that is meant to serve the great race that is the borrowers what contempt for money accounting it no better than dross it's always the borrower who will say oh money is not important at all what is money today it is with you tomorrow it will be with me the day after tomorrow it will be with somebody else money is not important at all it's always the borrower who says that and that is one reason why the borrower is always happy always goes around with pink cheeks and a very healthy complexion what a liberal confounding of those pedantic distinctions of meum and thuum or rather what a noble simplification of language resolving these supposed opposites into one clear intelligible pronoun adjective okay now the distinction between 
mine and yours is something that we are taught when we are very small and according to Lamb that is the root cause of all our problems that we're always thinking of what's mine and what's yours what's mine and what's his what's mine and what's hers all the time we're thinking of this this is my pen my class my students not your students not your class this is mine that is his so all the time we are confused um, because we have to distinguish between mine and thine but between meam and tuam and uh, lamb says how silly everything is mine see how simple that makes life everything is mine there's no distinction there is no other the self is the only thing very very selfish but then that is lamb's idea that's lamb's aspect so he says what near approaches doth he make to the primitive community to the extent of one half of the principle at least he is the true taxer who quote unquote calleth all the world up to be taxed and the distance is as vast between him and one of us as subsisted between the Augustan majesty and the poorest abulary Jew that paid it tribute pittance at Jerusalem so look at um, the comparison that uh, Lamb brings in he says the borrowers are as different from the lenders as Caesar and the Jew sitting in Jerusalem Caesar collecting all the money borrowing as it is from this Jew in Jerusalem who is worried about his money who's concerned about his wealth his property and there's Caesar there is the Augustan majesty there is the Emperor who has not a care in the world he is the one who's taking the money the Jew sitting in Jerusalem far away is the one who's giving the money and you see the difference the, the the king the emperor is happy is content the Jew is worried sick because he has to pay the small amount of money for security um, in in order to be considered a part of the Empire a part of the Roman Empire so the borrower is healthier happier than the lender his exactions too have such a cheerful voluntary air so far removed from your sour parochial or state gatherers those inkhorn varlets who carry their want of welcome in their faces and he takes this comparison one step further and he says that the Jew is the one who's always noting things down writing this is how much I have paid this is how much more I need to pay um, and he's keeping accounts he is writing down everything he's concerned that he he will make a mistake in his in his writing in his notations in his accounting do you think that the Emperor who is collecting that money is concerned no he has levied a tax so the tax will come to him he doesn't have to go there all that he does is he says all right so much percent must be paid by each individual and then he gathers in everything he doesn't think about how much more 
has to come. That is the job of that poor Jew who is lending the money or who is giving the money. He cometh to you with a smile, and this is the borrower, and troubleth you with no receipt, confining himself to no set season. So the, the borrower does not have a time or a place. He doesn't want anything written down. You as the lender want it to be written down. The borrower is not concerned. He says, doesn't make any difference. You know I'll return it. So you say, okay, let me write this down. On this date, at this time, I lent you so much. So please, will you sign? So he signs with a flourish and he goes. He doesn't even read what you have written because he's not going to return it. He is the borrower. He is the one who is careless, who's happy, who's not concerned with anything at all. Every day is his candle mass or his feast of Holy Michael. So every day is celebration for him. He doesn't have to be concerned about anything at all. So he comes with a smile and he's not concerned with any receipts at all. You as the lender are bothered. You want to have everything written down. For him, every day is Christmas. Every day is feast day. He calls it candle mass, um, the feast of Holy Michael. And he says for him, every day is celebration because he is not at all concerned with the nitty gritties of borrowing and um, lending. So he's happy, the lender is not. He is the true propontic which never ebbeth. His, he comes at no set season. His is the tide that comes in but does not go out. So he is rich, he is well fed, he is healthy. He's happy. The lender is the one who looks careworn, who looks frustrated, who snaps at everyone, not the borrower. The sea which taketh handsomely at each man's hand. So he doesn't limit himself to any one individual. He can borrow from anyone at any time, anywhere. He's, he's not concerned with time, place or manner because he's the borrower, he's not the lender. It's the lender who's concerned with time, place and manner. It's the lender who needs to keep track of how much he has coming to him. In vain the victim whom he delighteth to honor struggles with destiny. He is in the net. So no matter how much the lender struggles, the borrower is going to corner him, catch him by the scruff of the neck and get his money. Lend therefore cheerfully. So he says, you have to do it anyway. So might as well lend with a smile. O man ordained to lend, that thou lose not in the end with thy worldly penny the diversion promise. So the borrower always says, I'm going to return this to you. I'm not taking this money. I'm only borrowing it. So he says that um, this is something that, um, that, that, that the lender needs to think about. Why should he have such a careworn look? Why should he look so concerned? Why should he look so, um, so sick? He should s lend with a smile because, you know, the borrower might return the money. So lend with a smile. Combine not preposterously in thine own person the penalties of Lazarus and of Dives. And of course, Lamb has to throw in these names from the Bible, names of dead and sick people. Uh, you know, that Dives was cured and Lazarus was raised from the dead. So he says the lender should not look like um, a sick person or a dead person. He should smile cheerfully and lend the money cheerfully because he doesn't have a choice in the matter. The borrower is going to get that money because he has so much practice that 
it's no big deal for him to extract money out of you. So when thou seest the proper authority coming, when you see the borrower coming, smile and give him whatever he wants. Come a handsome sacrifice. See how light he makes of it. See how lightly the borrower takes it. He's not concerned, so why should you as lender be concerned? Strain not courtesies with a noble enemy. Reflections like the foregoing were forced upon my mind by the death of my old friend, Ralph Bygod Esquire, who departed this life on Wednesday evening, dying as he had lived without much trouble. He boasted himself a descendant from mighty ancestors of that name, who heretofore held ducal dignities in this realm. In his actions and sentiments, he belied not the stock to which he pretended. Early in life, he found himself invested with ample revenues, which with that noble disinterestedness, he took almost immediate measures entirely to dissipate and bring to nothing. For there is something revolting in this idea of a king holding a private purse. And the thoughts of by God were all regal. Thus furnished by the very act of disfurnishment, getting rid of the cumbersome luggage of riches, more apt to slacken virtue and abate her edge, than prompt her to do aught may merit praise. He set forth like some Alexander upon his great enterprise, borrowing and to borrow. That was a long sentence. So, Lamb says that I was forced to think upon these lines when my friend Ralph by God died. And this is the same Ralph by God, mind you, to whom he refers when he's talking about the chimney sweepers and he says that there were three tables at which these chimney sweepers were feasted. One was hosted by James White himself and the other, the other two tables were divided between um, Lamb and Ralph by God. So between um, these two, they shared the two tables that were left over. So this same Ralph by God, when he dies, Lamb is forced to think of how happy the borrower is and how unhappy the lender because he says all his life Ralph by God who had been born to riches borrowed money he was like a king he was uh, he was born in a noble family he had a lot of money but when he came into this money he proceeded to immediately transfer that money, give away that money, throw it away, use it, spend it. And all his life, he lived on borrowed money. Um, Lamb again brings in a comparison. And um, here he compares Ralph Bygorge to the Emperor Alexander, who set out to conquer the world and who looked for more and more countries so um, Ralph Bygord's aim in life was to borrow, borrow, and borrow further. So um, Lamb says, I saw Ralph Bygord and I saw what he was like throughout his life. I was a witness and I have never seen a happier man. He died happy, although he, um, he, he was uh, living on borrowed money, but it didn't bother him any um, that uh, he had borrowed money from people. He was absolutely carefree. Uh, he was like some Emperor Alexander saying, I'm going to borrow uh, and uh, nobody can stop me. In his perigesis or triumphant progress throughout this island, and this island, remember, is England, it has been calculated that he laid a tithe part of the inhabitants under contribution. I reject this estimate as greatly exaggerated, but having had the honor of accompanying my friend diverse times in his preambulations about this vast city, 
I own I was greatly stuck at first by the prodigious number of faces we met who claimed a sort of respectful acquaintance with us. So, um, Lamb says that in, during his life, I had the opportunity to accompany my friend Ralph by God. Uh, a lot of times we, were, we, we went everywhere together and he said wherever we went, Ralph by God always knew people. Um, it is said that um, he had borrowed money from a certain percentage of uh, people in Great Britain. Lamb says that's an exaggeration, but um, in spite of this being an exaggeration, what I did notice was that wherever we went, whatever part of the city we went to, there were always people who knew Ralph Pycod and who were always very uh, respectful towards Ralph Pycod. And the reason why these people were respectful were that Ralph Pycod had borrowed money from them. And because he had borrowed money from them, they couldn't afford to be unpleasant to him. He might refuse to return the money. So as long as he had their money and he owed them money, they were very, very respectful to him. He was one day so obliging as to explain the phenomenon. It seems these were his tributaries, feeders of his exchequer, gentlemen, his good friends to whom he had occasionally been beholden for a loan. Their multitudes did not in any way disconcert him. He rather took a pride in numbering them and with commerce seemed pleased to be stocked with so fair a herd. So one day when he saw Lamb looking a little concerned at the, the number of people who knew him, um, he explained and he says, you know, um, these are feeders to my exchequer. He was like a king. It's the king who talks about the exchequer, the royal treasury. And he says, these are the people who give money to the, the, to the treasury. Um, these are the tributaries to his river. Now you know that a river has to have tributaries because it's these tiny streams that bring water to the river and that increase the volume of the water in the river until it falls down into the sea. So these are tributaries, these are the people who keep on giving me money uh, and, uh, and they're always very respectful, you know, not, not a single one of them was ever rude to him. And here let me tell you um, something that is concerned more with, um, with, with our dealing with, um, with money these days. It is said um, that um, if you borrow um, 100,000 rupees from a bank, the bank owns you in the sense that the bank can penalize you, can, um, can impose fines on you if you don't pay it back on time. But if you, if you borrow a hundred crore from a bank, then you own the bank because the bank will never want to offend you, will never do anything to make you angry and you look around you you see all the people who owe money to the banks they owe millions and billions and they're going around feeling unconcerned not at all worried not at all bothered that they have to pay back that money and the bank is the one who is concerned the bank obliges, the bank wants 
to make those people happy because the bank doesn't want to offend them. So it's like these people that Ralph by God um, meets and who are very respectful to him uh, and who seem to be very, very happy. So with such sources, it was a wonder how he contrived to keep his treasury always empty. And Lamb is being ironic here. And he says, with so many people willing to lend him money, how is it that his friend never had any money? And the reason was that he did it by force of an aphorism which he had often in his mouth, that money kept longer than three days stinks. So he made use of it while it was fresh. He spent it as fast as it came in. As fast as he borrowed, he spent it out again. A good part he drank away, for he was an excellent toss pot, so he would spend a lot of money on, on wine and alcohol and drinks. Some he gave away, the rest he threw away, literally tossing and hurling it violently from him, as if it had been infectious. So, easy come, easy go. The money that he borrowed, he gave away as fast as um, it came in. Or he would bury it, but he would never seek it again. And that is a little difficult to believe, but if Lamb says it, we have no choice. And he would bury it by a river's side under some bank, which paid no interest. And he's, now he's uh, making a pun upon the word bank. The bank of the river and the bank in which you deposit money. The bank in which you deposit money pays you an interest, gives you additional money. The bank of the river, if you bury your money there, is not going to give you interest, is probably going to destroy those currency notes. Uh, but out away from him, it must go peremptorily. And Lamb goes on to say, the streams were perennial, which fed his fisk. When new supplies became necessary, the first stranger was sure to contribute to the deficiency. And he had such a good manner that it was very difficult to refuse to lend to him. He had a cheerful, open exterior, a quick, jovial eye, a bald forehead, just touched with grey. He anticipated no excuse and found none. So he looked very pleasant, he looked jovial, he looked happy, and when he uh, asked uh, you for money, there was no way that he could be refused because he asked in such a, a pleasant uh, manner. He was, um, he was a thorough gentleman in that sense. Uh, he was never nasty, uh, never disrespectful. And so um, he, he, he got respect in return. And if he was out of cash, the first stranger that he met would be asked for some money. And so Pleasant was his manner that nobody could refuse him. As he says, he anticipated no excuse and found none. Nobody made excuses because he expected no excuses. And waving for a while my theory as to the great race, I would put it to the most untheorizing reader who may at times have disposable coin in his pocket, whether it is not more repugnant to the kindliness of his nature to refuse such a one as I am describing than to say no to a poor petitionary rogue who by his mumping visnomy tells you that he expects nothing better and therefore whose uh, preconceived notions and expectations you do in reality so much less shock in the refusal. So he says let's put aside my theory uh, of the great race um, and I put a question to you as reader what would you do if you were asked by a person um, whose physiognomy I have uh, described who comes from a very good family who was born with a lot of money 
would you be able to refuse him? No. On the other hand, if a man asks you for money and he looks poor, he's badly dressed, maybe in worn out, maybe in torn clothes, and he comes to you and he begs you for a penny, what would you do? You will refuse him. You'll refuse him because he's begging you and he's begging you because he expects a refusal. So you don't want to disappoint him and you say, I don't have any money. You might have all the money in the world, but you will not give it to him because he's dressed badly and because he comes to you with the expectation of being rejected, of being turned down. Whereas this gentleman who borrows from everyone comes to you with the expectation of getting that money and so very quietly you hand him whatever you have in your pocket. When I think of this man, his fiery glow of heart, his swell of feeling, how magnificent, how ideal he was, how great at the midnight hour and when I compare him with him, the companions with whom I have associated since, I grudge the saving of a few idle ducats and think that I am fallen into the society of lenders and little men. So Lamb, when he thinks of his deceased friend, is filled with a certain amount of nostalgia and he thinks of how jovial he was, how good a friend, how good a company he provided. He says, you know, I feel sorry that the money I have, I did not give to him who was so happy and who spent it um, so fast. So Lamb puts himself in that position and he says, you know, when I compare myself to to Ralph by God, um, I feel as if I am like those little men, those lenders who, um, who, who had a certain sense of inferiority when faced with this great borrower, this, this man who moved like a king and who expected to be obliged by everyone. Uh, and Lamb says, I feel very small. I feel that I am uh, of the category of those lenders. To one like Ilya, whose treasures are rather seized um, or rather cased in leather covers than closed in iron coffers, there is a class of alienators more formidable than that which I have touched upon. And now Lamb shifts his focus a little and from money he turns to books as he says cased in leather covers rather than iron coffers rather than in a vault um, Elia's treasure is in the form of books and the category that he is going to focus on now is the borrowers of books, those mutilators of collections, spoilers of the symmetry of shelves and creators of odd volumes. There is Cumberbatch matchless in his depredations. So from Ralph Bygod, the one who borrowed money from every human being he came into contact with, he moves to the borrowers of books and these borrowers of books, Lamb says, are to be despised because they spoil the collections. They will t take some books and put it in their house where a set is not complete. So if it is, let's say, a set of encyclopedia, he will borrow six or seven volumes and put them in his bookshelf and spoil the collection from where he has taken it. So these are people that um, 
Elia does not think highly about. That foul gap in the bottom shelf facing you like a great eye tooth knocked out. Look at the, the metaphors, the similes that, um, that Lamb is bringing in. The eye tooth is a very important tooth. It's one of the front teeth. And if that falls out, it changes your appearance entirely. So these borrowers, when they take these books away, they spoil the beauty of the library. Okay, so with the huge Switzer-like Switzer tomes on each side, so what they do is they have these books on the bookshelf and they'll take two books from here, three from here, another one from another shelf and spoil the entire symmetry, um, spoil the beauty that has been created with a lot of effort, with the help of money, um, with the help of time. It's not easy to make up a library for yourself. So, um, and Lamb goes on to say, I confess for me to suffer by than to refute, namely, that the title to property in a book is an exact ratio to the claimant's powers of understanding and appreciating the same. So he moves from that topic and he says that the ownership of a book is in the hands of a man who can understand and appreciate the text. He gives a mathematical um, equation and he says that the right to ownership is in relation to the individual's understanding and appreciation of the book. So if the one who has the book does not understand and appreciate it, then it should be given to him who can understand it and who does appreciate it. Should he go on acting upon this theory, which of our shelves is safe? So, he says, if I believe in this, if Elia believes in this, then we are letting ourselves open to daylight robbery because people are going to say, I understand this book, I appreciate such and such a writer, so this book is mine, that book also belongs to me. So he says, if we believe in this theory, then our books are not safe at all. Anyone can come and lay claim to it and say, I appreciate this writer more than you do. The slight vacuum in the left-hand case, scarcely distinguishable but by the quick eye of a loser, was Willome the commodious resting place of brown on urn burial. So now Lamb is referring to one particular book that has been taken away from him. C will hardly allege that he knows more about that treatise than I do, who introduced it to him and was indeed the first to discover its beauties. But so have I known a foolish lover to praise his mistress in the presence of a rival more qualified to carry her off than himself. And then he brings in another comparison and uh, mind you students, I want you to keep on thinking that this is basically a comparison essay and um, at each step Lamb brings two entities and makes a comparison um, and uh, in, that, in that analysis he tries to prove which one of them is better than the other. So when he brings this idea in of um, ownership being related to understanding and appreciation of a book, he goes a little further and he says that um, if we start believing in this and if we start practicing this, then very soon all our books are going to disappear. And he says, you know, um, when, when you come to my library, you see a gap in, uh, in my bookshelf in a certain place. And that gap is discernible only to me because I have lent that book. 
you may not be able to perceive that gap and he says that this gap was created because I was challenged that um, the, the, the reader, the borrower understood and appreciated the book more than I did even though I introduced him to this writer, I introduced um, the text to him and yet he claimed the book because he said I appreciate it more than you do. Uh, it's just lying in your bookcase and you've not even read it again. So uh, I need to read it and therefore I have a greater right to this book than you do. And um, then Lamb brings in a further example and he says that this is like praising your beloved to a man who is physically, financially, socially better than you. If you praise your beloved so much to a man, then he might carry off your beloved because he is so much um, more appreciative. He's, he's so much uh, better endowed than you can ever be. So it's a very great risk that you run with praising books that you own to people who have not read them. Just below Dodsley's dramas want their fourth volume where Vittoria Corambona is. The remainder nine are as distasteful as Priam's refused sons when the fates borrowed Hector. Here stood the anatomy of melancholy in sober state. There loitered the complete angler, quiet as in life by some stream side. In yonder nook John Bunkle, a widower volume, with eyes closed, I moans his ravished mate. So he then gives books an entity. He makes his books um, animate by referring to them uh, as, as human beings, as characters. So in, in order to, um, to, to lend a certain uh, reliability to his, uh, to his words, Lamb um, pictures uh, these books as having um, as having uh, animate bodies as having characters and he talks about certain books that are missing from his bookshelf and how um, the books that are left behind mourn the departure of those that have gone and you know mourning is only um, limited to human beings, so Lamb is giving them human status. One justice I must do my friend, that if he sometimes, like the sea, sweeps away a treasure at another time, sea-like, he throws up as rich an equivalent to match it. So this particular friend that he's talking about, he says, um, there is a saving grace, and the saving grace is that he is like the sea. So when the sea ebbs, it also flows. When this person takes books away from me, he also brings me books. And in that sense, he says he's like the sea. I have a small under collection of this nature picked up. He has forgotten at what odd places and deposited with as little memory as mine. I take in these orphans the twice deserted. These proselytes of the gate are welcome as the true Hebrews. There they stand in conjunctions, natives and naturalized. The latter seem as little disposed to inquire out their true lineage as I am. So then he makes another comparison and he says, you know, this friend of mine not only borrows books but he also so gives me books. I don't know where he picks up these books, probably from some other people, but whatever the case may be, I place these books in a different shelf from mine. And they have become almost a part of my library. And the books that are, that are mine have accepted these 
new coming books, these books to which I do not have ownership, um, but these books have been accepted as if they are also mine. And here again he brings in an example of um, a, a citizen of a country and one who is naturalized, one who is given a citizenship. So one who is born in that country is the books that Lamb owns and the naturalized citizen are the books that his friend has brought for him. So he says that uh, the citizen and the naturalized for me hold the same significance. I do not distinguish between my books and the books that my friend has, uh, has brought. They are as dear to me as my own books. I charge no warehouse room for these deodorants, nor shall ever put myself to the ungentlemanly trouble of advertising a sale of them to pay expenses. So he says that um, I have accepted these books and I make no discrimination between my books and the ones that my friend has brought in. They are as welcome, they get as good a place in my library shelves as my own and I do not even um, ask for any, um, any tax or any payment because I am keeping them. For me, they are as dear as my own books. So to lose a volume to see carries some sense and meaning in it. You are sure that he will make one hearty meal on your viands if he can give no account of the platter after it. But what moved thee, wayward, spiteful K, to be so impassionate to carry off with thee, in spite of tears and adjurations to thee to forbear the letters of that princely woman, the thrice noble Margaret Newcastle. So there are some books that Lamb does not really mind lending. There are some people to whom Lamb does not mind lending, but there are others who have taken away certain books to which he was very attached. And these were books that he read again and again. And amongst these, he says, were the letters of Margaret Newcastle. Knowing at the time and knowing that I knew also thou most assuredly wouldst never turn over one leaf of the illustrious folio. So what bothers Lamb is not the taking away of books, but the taking away of books by people who will never read these books. That is what bothers Lamb the most. What but the mere spirit of contradiction and childish love of getting the better of thy friend, then worst cut of all, to transport it with thee to the Gallican land, unworthy land to harbor such a sweetness, a virtue in which all ennobling thoughts dwelt, pure thoughts, kind thoughts, high thoughts, her sex's wonder. Hadst thou not playbooks, and books of jests and fancies about thee, to keep thee merry even as thou keepest all companies with thy quips and mirthful tales. So Lamb has um, this objection to the person who has uh, borrowed or who has taken away the letters of Margaret Newcastle, the one that he refers to as uh, spiteful K. He says, you took it away and you're not even going to turn over a single page to read what has been written. So I don't mind lending my books, but I do mind lending them to people who never appreciate the book, who will never read the book. And not only did he borrow the book or did he take the book, but he took it across the sea, across the channel, and he took this book with him to France and Lamb feels very frustrated and he says, you're not the kind of person who's going to read the letters of Margaret Newcastle. Why could you not have taken any other book? Are you not satisfied with the books of jokes and jests that you have? Because uh, your nature, your temperament is not going to allow you to read the letters of uh, Margaret Newcastle, child of the green room, it was unkindly done of thee. So 
um, he feels very strongly about this one particular book. Thy wife too, that part French, better part English woman, that he could fix upon no other treatise to bear away in kindly token of remembering us than the works of Folk Graville, Lord Brooke, of which no Frenchman nor woman of France, Italy or England was ever by nature constituted to comprehend a tittle. Was there not Zimmerman on solitude? So he, he feels very frustrated at some of the books that have been taken away. And um, this one particular uh, book um, that was taken away, he says, is a book that no one in France, Italy or England would be able to understand let alone appreciate this writing. So he says, at least you could have left me with this book that I understand, but which other people are not going to understand. Could you not see a book that would have been easier for you to understand and less of a loss for me, like Zimmerman on solitude? Reader, if happily thou art blessed with a moderate collection, be shy of showing it, and Lamb changes his track completely. Or if thy heart overfloweth to lend them, lend thy books. But let it be to such a one as STC, he will return them, genuinely anticipating the time appointed with usury, enriched with annotations, tripling their value, I have had experience. So Lamb changes tracks and he says, you, the reader, are welcome to lend your books. But when you lend your books, make sure that it is someone like Coleridge, someone like Samuel Taylor Coleridge. And dear students, you know that Lamb was very attached to Samuel Taylor Coleridge and he valued his friendship a lot. And in fact, the year that Coleridge died was a year that was very painful for Charles Lamb. And it was not even six months before Lamb also followed Coleridge to the grave. So he was very, very attached to Coleridge and he admired Coleridge. And uh, one of the reasons he gives us here in this essay, The Two Races of Men, where he says, if you must give your books, give it to someone like Coleridge, because not only will he return them on time, but he appreciates what you have done. Um, and he says their value, the, the value of the book is increased because what Coleridge did was he annotated the books, he wrote in the margins, he gave his own comments, and for Lamb, those comments, those annotations, increase the value of the book. So precious are these comments that, that um, Coleridge has, has made on Lamb's book, that Lamb says it increases the value of the book. And he says, I have had experience. I have ha I've loaned books to Coleridge and I have received them back with interest. And the interest is the comments that he makes in the margins of the pages. Many are these precious manuscripts of his, not unfrequently vying with the originals in no very clerkly hand, legible in my Daniel, in old Burton, in Sir Thomas Brown and those abstruser cogitations of the Greville, now alas, wandering in pagan lands, I counsel thee, shut not thy heart nor thy li library against STC. And Lamb refers to Coleridge by his initials only, but the discerning reader knows that STC stands for Samuel Taylor Coleridge. So he says that um, I have many books which have been returned with interest, which have been returned 
with comments by Samuel Taylor Coleridge and he gives you names of these books and he says that I consider that um, these books have increased in value and the only one that I feel sad about is um, the one by Fulk Graville which he, he had made a lot of comments and annotations on and which has been taken by that spiteful K and it has gone to pagan lands, it has gone to a country where nobody is going to read less, le, let alone appreciate um, the book for the quality of the work and for the quality uh, and value of the comments that have been written on the sides. So he winds up this essay uh, with advice to the reader and the advice is that if you um, have a friend like Coleridge uh, then not only does Lamb advise keeping him close to your heart but he says open your heart and your library to such a person if you have the good luck to have a friend like Coleridge lend him whatever you can because he's going to bring it back with interest he's going to bring it back with lots of commentaries and you are not going to lose anything in this transaction you will only gain by those comments that he adds to each page of the book. Um, let us quickly recap what we have done today in this two great races of men. Um, and he, uh, Lamb, in the very beginning, makes this distinction between the two races and he says that there is a race of men who are the borrowers and a race of men called the lenders and um, he dispenses with caste, color, creed, uh, and geographical locations, and he divides human beings into two categories. And then he takes it one step further, and he says that the, the worst possible thing um, that can happen to someone who owns books is to have a friend who borrows books because the borrower is very happy the borrower does not think about the consequences but the lender feels the loss and then he moves on from there and he um, gives examples of various books that have been taken away from him um, and various books that have been given to him but he winds up the essay by giving the example of Coleridge and he says that if it is a person like Coleridge who borrows books from you then dear reader always be willing to give your books because when such a one as Coleridge returns the books it's always with very valuable uh, comments given on the in the margins on the sides of um, the, the book pages and so uh, the time that the book has gone away from you is time in which the value has been increased and when it comes back to you it comes back with interest and you can only appreciate the interest that the book has accumulated in the meanwhile thank you for being patient and Allah Hafiz